Welcome back to the morning show here on our Ice News. Despite the expected benefits from the privatization of Nigeria's power sector, which has been in effect for a number of years, electricity consumers are still complaining about inadequate power supply and exorbitant billing by the distribution companies. Politicians have been getting away with convenient explanations of why the situation persists. But for the generating, transmitting, and distribution companies, it has been a far harder task trying to convince Nigerians why they should not enjoy value for their money. For a perspective on this interplay of a number of issues, we are now being joined by Sunday Odunton, the spokesman of the Association of Nigerian Electricity Distributors and the Chief Executive Officer of SDM Integrated Ventures. Sunday Odunton, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Good morning. Very good. good morning. You know, electricity is a subject we've uh, focused on heavily on this uh, program because of its strategic importance, yes. not just for livelihoods, but also for the uh, Nigerian economy. Yeah. Now, but one thing we've observed is that, you know, we don't know what the figures are uh, in terms of capacity. The discos quote a different figure. Right. The state officials quote a, a, state of, of, uh, a different set of figures. Now, do you have an idea what the current and real capacity is in Nigeria in terms of generation, transmission, and distribution? of electricity. Thank you very much. Um, I will quote the latest figure, which was a figure um, that was contained in the report by Siemen. Siemen uh, authored a report called Siemens Nigeria's Electricity Roadmap Report. In that report, clearly Siemen um, went in depth into what each layer of that value chain can do. First of all, let me um, say to our viewers that electricity is a product, like any other product. So we need to know that, which means every product comes at a cost. Number two, no country in this world can develop without electricity, so which means it is a very, very essential sector. Now, for the generation, according to that report, currently in Nigeria, the generation and I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk in relation to installed capacity and available capacity. Installed capacity is what is there installed. But not necessarily, not, it's not as if it can be used straight away, but it's there. That like the potential is there, installed. Available capacity is what is available. And even that, should there be any um, kind of... Um, stranded or something that cannot be used out of that, I will explain. So generation capacity, as of today in Nigeria, is 13,000, just about a little over 13,000 megawatts. Okay. That's the available, that's the installed capacity. But the available capacity is just about 8,000 megawatts. Right. Out of that 8,000 megawatts, about 2,000 megawatts is stranded. Stranded mostly because of gas constraint, and I'll give you an example, and of course, partly because of hydro and transmission limitation. That's for generation. I'll still explain what that gas constraint means in reality. So that's the first one at the top. Generation, followed by transmission in the middle, followed by distribution that I represent below the value chain. So for distribution, according to that report, the Transmission Company of Nigeria, which is 100% owned by the federal government, the tested capacity, and I use the word tested in real life, the set tested capacity is 5,500 megawatts. They have never done up to that, yeah. and they have never done more than that. But um, average daily transmission in this country as of today, according to that report, is 3,700 megawatts. But of course, you also hear from them this government corporation saying that they have 8,100 megawatts. That is not true. That was as a result of computer simulation. Computer simulation cannot go for the real life test because in this country we have 60 years of neglect, which means we have a lot of dilapidated infrastructure. So 5,500 for the middle one. Okay. For distribution, the installed capacity, according to that report, is about 11,000 megawatts, which means if you take 11,000 megawatts to the discourse, they should be able to distribute that. And that, I need to also uh, mention, that is an increment from what we knew as of 2015. Right. 
when TCN um, came up with the stress test, the result of the stress test, which says that the discourse can distribute 6,288 megawatts. So today, according to that report, it's about 11,000. And that same report also determined, and that's also important, the report said distribution of electricity in Nigeria is impeded by transmission. That's the issue of capacity and the figures. Mm. So what you're saying is that the weakest link is at the level of transmission. Exactly. Yeah, but that's not what the, uh, what the uh, government spokespersons are saying. Well, you speak for the discourse. You know, government spokespersons are saying that the discourse do not have the capacity, you know, to evacuate and distribute uh, available electricity. And that, indeed, what they have seen is that the, uh, you know, the uh, privatization, the emergence of the discos and the uh, Jenkos in uh, 20, was it 2013, uh, was not properly managed, and that this government would take a second look at it and perhaps even buy off, you know, uh, uh, the uh, Jenkos and the discos and review the contract. Well, those are two different issues that you have just raised. The first one about capacity. Yes. This is scientific. We're talking about electricity. We're talking about something that can be verified, that can be tested and seen. Um, the last time I checked, seamen did not come to the country at the invitation of the discourse. So for them who are coming here to invest, they did their own assessment, they did a lot of checks, and that's the figure I've just filled out for you. So the issue of capacity is there. For us, we are a private sector. We are not interested in the politics of electricity. We are more interested in supply of electricity because a group of people who own this 60% equity, they pay the cash sum of $1.4 billion. You cannot pay that kind of money and buy some entities with that kind of money and for you to want it to fail. So it is the interest of the disco investors for this industry to succeed. So anybody who is talking about uh, they don't have capacity, they don't have this, that is getting more and more Political. Like I said, we are not there yet. Um, the reform process started around 2001, 2002, during the regime of President Lucien Gompasanjo, and it is a journey, a very long journey. We are not even halfway into that journey. In other countries, we copied this model that we use in this country from um, New Delhi in India. In other countries, what you find is that it takes an average of 10 years before you can even begin to settle down. And part of the reason for Nigeria's problem is that we have had a minimum of 60 years of neglect. Uh, like I've said elsewhere, um, if you look at, like, let me just pick a period. Between 1989 and 1999, that's a period of 10 years in this country. Mm -hmm. Within that period, Nigeria was ruled by four different rulers. Number one, General Babangida, after 1989. Uh, Number two, uh, Shiva Number three, General uh, Abacha. Number four, General Absalam Abubakar. Yes. Within that 10 year period, between these four Nigerian rulers, they budgeted money for power every year. The budget is a public document. But they did not build a single power plant in that 10 year period. What does it mean? What it means is that within that 10 year period, the Nigerian population continues to grow every day. But we did not grow our own electricity to measure up with the population. So you have, of course, we don't even know the actual population of Nigeria, but they say about, about 200 million. Let's say 180 million. The rule of thumb is that you produce 1,000 megawatt per 1 million populace. For us, we are about 200 million, and we're still talking about 5,000 megawatts, 8,000 megawatts, even 10,000 megawatts. So it is too low compared with the population in the country. So that's the issue of availability. That's why they take off light from one side and give it to another side. That then, that neglect of 60 years means that what you failed to do in 1970 will catch up with you in 2017. Whatever you did not do well in year 2000, by 2020, you begin to feel it. So what we have is inadequate um, electricity in terms of quantum, then dilapidated infrastructure, then lack of massive investment. Right. Those are the issues. I mean, I mean, talking about the issues, ultimately, we've talked about issues with supply, and naturally, as a result of that, we talk about infrastructure. But if we know that discos regularly reject electricity supply from Jenkos, 
as a result, that creates more collabs. So is I mean, don't you think that there should be more that's collaboration a, between the two true. of them? Okay. It's not true? I love that it's not true. What happens in our sector is what we call load dumping as against load rejection. Sure. And I'll explain what that means. But talking about um, um, we are discos, we are distributors, like distribution of bread. If there's a baker who has a bakery somewhere and produces bread, there's a transporter, like a truck, that goes to pick the bread from the point of production and bring it to the point of distribution. Sure. The distributor is going to pay for the product. For the product. Azumi has maybe three outlets, one in Ikeja, one in Magodo, one somewhere in Lekki. He has a right to tell the trailer where he wants the goods to be sent to, because that's where he has his own maybe viable customers, or ready customers, or where he needs it. If because of bad truck, bad tire, bad brake, bad road, the truck decides to go and put it somewhere else, yes. he has a right to reject. Yes. That's what's called load dumping. What the TCN does is load dumping. That's one. Number two, it is very uh, interesting. We have always called for three things that are missing. When you have evaluation like that, each of them are interdependent on one another. So we need to have cooperation, collaboration, and alignment. I'm happy you mentioned the word collaboration. The people in this sector, for a long time, are not talking to each other. Right. We expect the federal government, who are the policy makers, the policy drivers, in this case, the federal ministers of power. We also expect the regulators of this sector to come together, provide the needed leadership, get these three um, layers to work together and collaborate together. What we have today, we have tariff mismatch, because what you have is distribution people, or a distributor of bread, yes. who is buying bread from that bakery at 80 Naira, but the law now compels him to be selling at 30 right. Naira, and nobody is giving any subsidy or anything. Yes. What that means is that it's a matter of time, it can't be efficient, and okay. those are the kind of problems that happen. So we lack that uh, collaboration. Uh, how soon should we expect an improvement? Well, first, we all need to acknowledge that in the last five years, there has been an improvement. Um, if you look at what we have today, as again, what we had five years ago, yes, there has been an improvement. There's need for an more improvement. improvement. What, on the power supply in this country, mm. there is. But the issue of collaboration is a very important issue. But four, four issues are important to drive this power sector, generally. Number one is the issue of sanctions of contract. When federal government sign contract with any private investors, they should try and keep to their words. Every single thing that they committed to in the last contract they signed in 2013, they need on every single of those. The other thing is the issue of regulatory and policy consistency. If that is missing, then we still have problem. Of course, cost recovery. For any, every businessman, if you put your money into any business, you want to be able to recover your costs. That's why the issue of tariff mismatch is very important. You can't be buying any product and underselling the same product, and then people expect efficiency. They don't want to be contributing money to buy poles and transform all those things. That's also there. Then the issue of proper allocation of risk. Again, for all of this, this is where the government, the federal government, and the regulator need to step in and provide proper leadership without politics, without sentiment. At the end of the day, uh, this is a very heavily regulated industry. Whoever is not performing well, there are laid down sanctions. But if you and I had a contract and you promised to do one to five and you asked me to do six to ten, and in that contract, the performance of number six to ten is predicated upon me performing one to five. If I fail to perform one to five, yes. Talking about performance, yes. you've identified transmission as the weakest link. Yes. You've talked about the politicization of the process. Yes. You've talked about the need uh, to respect contracts. But government spokespersons have also said that the discos, the distributors, are not playing their, their part. You know, you take electricity from uh, the Jenkos, you are supposed to pay, but you are owing the Nigerian bulk electricity uh, trader, the bulk trader you know, a lot of money. And that, you know, according to, uh, you know, the NERC, it poses a serious threat. So it's like the distributors, you are not fulfilling your own obligations. You and then much. you complain about a whole lot of I, things. I use the analogy of bread. Let me, let me start with one point. 
I'm not, I'm not blaming the others in the value chain. We are not engaged in blame game. Right? But we have a right to reply to inaccuracies or lies being peddled around. But the point is this. I will still use the same analogy of bread for it to be easy for people to understand. You are a bread seller, a retailer, distributor and retailer of bread. A bakery produces bread. That bakery produces that bread at a cost. You have to get flour. The flour may have to get um, wheat from a farmer. So by the time this thing gets to you, there's a cost. And you are buying at a particular cost, for instance, 80 naira. But because this, the price of this is fixed, or let's say that bread, the flat price is fixed, and you are compared by law, by regulation, by the regulator to be selling at 30 naira, and there's a shortfall building every day, mm -hmm. and nobody is taking care of that shortfall. Now, before you even sell, you, you've taken this bread, say 4,000 bread, loaves of bread, 80 naira each. Before you sell, because you are going to be selling at 30 naira, there's an already standard loss of 50 naira. So are you saying loan. the business is not profitable? It is not profitable. For the distributors. It and is it, not okay, profitable. And is that why, you know, uh, discos pass the cost to the uh, ele to electricity consumers? That through, ex so. through estimated billing that and resistance so. of the meter access uh, provider policy. No. Because it's like, you know, discos don't want to give us uh, meters. Discos prefer estimated billing. Thank you. You know, See? is that the uh, tactics that you have Thank adopted? you very much. I'm even happy you, you alluded, you, you mentioned this. Again, this part of the misconception in the minds of Nigerians. And it is always good for us to explain. Number one, these calls do not, cannot, and should not never in any way impede or do anything against Mr. Asset Providers. We work on that map. Here, in, this is the code disco that we are in. Meters have been provided as we speak. All over the country, the process has started. It is, it's, it's a bit slow because of the process of getting it done. That's one. Number two, estimated billing is not in our interest. Uh, estimated billing comes in two ways. We have overbilling, which is what people call crazy billings. But not all bills are crazy. It also comes in form of what we call underbilling. So for us, the best thing for Nigeria is for everybody to be metered. If you are metered, then we can measure what you use. Remember, the incident of estimated billing also increased the incident of energy theft. So it is not in our interest for there not to be meters. So we are not impeding that. It is in our interest for people to have meters. Then paying to the market, I've just explained it. There's no way I can pay 100% back to the market when I'm selling far, far below the cost. That is also, no, and I'm happy that the current uh, regulator, NEC, currently, are also working on the issue surrounding um, the figures, interest rates, the forex issue, those things that have changed since the last time we fixed the last, uh, the current tariff. So these are issues that anybody can look up to and check. So it's not about us impeding anything. We can't and we will not. I mean, okay, still on the issue of meterings, I know that you said you're not impeding on it, you're not stopping or halting the process, but are you actively collaborating? Are you actively working oh, with 100%. them? 100%, because for areas that we have metered, we have what we call revenue assurance. Once I meter your estate, we reinforce it electronically, and what we do is that at the end of the day, we can be sure that we we'll collect money from, and we can monitor it properly where there is estimated billing. When you see a shop or any house in the afternoon, the light is on. 95% of the time, in that house, they have no meter. Even energy management has something to do with whether you are metered or not. And I know for sure that those who are metered, like Ruben, he won't put on the light off chairs while being downstairs watching TV in, in the evening. People will manage their city better when they have meters. So we are not impeding it. We are working with them. But they have their own challenges. There are challenges in the system. But like I said, this thing will go away. It's just a matter of time. Well, I mean, what I see, what I know is that many Nigerians are not happy with the state of electricity no supply. Yes. You recall that the Benin Disco has been a major source of controversy. In yes. Benin, sometimes when they see a, a, an electricity official, you know, they either beat him up or, you know, they carry placards or whatever. Now, but there are two excuses that the discos have been given. One, you claim that you are being owed a lot of money by the MDAs, ministries, departments, and agencies of government. Now, what is the level? That's not an excuse. The second that, that's one, a fact. The second one yes. is you also complain about energy theft. Yes. Now, what 
Do you want to comment on that and what okay, is being quickly, done to address on that? On energy theft, I'm sorry to use the word, there are so many thieves in this country. People believe in getting things free of charge. The, the issue of paying for electricity has been a very, very serious matter because a lot of people don't want to pay. But you hear them saying, we are ready to pay, give up light. Now, 47% on average of installed prepaid meters are bypassed. Yeah. People say they want prepaid meters. You now give them prepaid meters, they go ahead and bypass them. I was in jobs about three and a half weeks ago, and uh, we, we noticed that 200,000 customers with prepaid meters have not vended for 12 months. They have not bought any credits in one year. So we went to the network to do investigation in a place called Rayfield, which is a highbrow area for the rich in Joss. Eventually, the police arrested a 22-year-old boy who specializes in bypassing meters in a very ingenious way. And what you find is that in the Kedja GRA, same thing that happened in Sabo, the same thing with the rich people in the Kedja GRA, they will bypass their air conditioners and a lot of things. Just like in Benin, it is very uh, important for me to mention that out of all the 11 discos, the disco that has installed the highest number of meters is Benin Disco. Benin Disco covers four states, Edo, Delta, Ondo, and Ekisi State. Funny enough, the problem they have is more with Edo State, less with Delta, Ekisi, and uh, Ondo State. Oh, yet, yet, 47% of their energy they get energy, their own allocation of energy, normally it should be 25, 25 percent. For the, four of them. Yes, 47 percent go to a door alone. In part of that, that is the most restive area. That's the place where we even call so many hoteliers. I was there personally in Benin, where hoteliers, many of them, good ones are there, but many of them that were very disordered were bypassing all their ACs and all their. So these issues are just everywhere. It's not just limited to Benin, it's not about the people or certain tribe, or certain state. It's about us. And I keep telling people, because sometimes this thing happens with connivers of our own staff. And when people complain about our staff, I always use the well, sentence. Well, Sandy Odunton, we will have to uh, bring this to a close at this point. I know you're already, uh, you know, uh, getting really uh, enthusiastic. But we want to thank you very much thank you. Uh, for coming to the thank Morning Show. Thank you very show. much.